We're going to be looking at 10 league winners for fantasy football that's going to help you smack your friends in the face, help you win that money, and give you those bragging rights. But before we do, you have to smash that subscribe button right now. Give it a good click with the mouse on your computer. Tap it with your finger on your phone. Whatever you got to do, you got to get it done so you can stop missing out this content that's coming out every day with the information on these players, strategies, helping you with waiver wires, helping you build your teams through your draft, and everything else. We're going to help you win your leagues right here, but let's dig in here. Let's look at these 10 players today, and then let's see how we can build our teams. First off, we're going to be looking at Darren Waller. I haven't talked about him. All off season, really. And the reason why is because everyone else has been. Everyone has been speculating on him. But if I don't talk about him, then maybe some of you guys are going to realize, like, hey, Bruce isn't talking about Darren. Maybe we should be avoiding him. Right now, TE4. Tight end 4 and ADP due to underdog fantasy, which should be very transparent to regular redraft anyways. Should be very comparable there. Might be a shade cheaper in basic redraft leagues. You just got to see what's going on in your home league. But here, average depth of target, 13.6 last year and 13 deep balls played in just 9 games, 13.9 yards per reception. And then I hope you saw the preseason game. He got 4 targets, caught 3 of those balls, and looked good. Looks like Danny Dimes is going to be targeting him a lot. Danny Dimes is going to be airing it out a bit. Looks like we got a schedule here that looks well for that too. And Darren Waller is going to be a beneficiary of that. And he's down the draft a little bit in ADP where you can still load up a wide receiver and running back. And you want to make sure you pay for a good tight end. Darren Waller might be your guy. If you like making sure you're good at the tight end spot, you want a tight end that you know that's getting targets, and you don't mind paying that draft capital Darren Waller is a guy you want to look at because there's good opportunity here. There's opportunity that he could hit his upside due to the nature of the offense. We've had injuries throughout his career lately, but still, we have good athleticism. We have good volume in offense. We have a lot of good opportunity here for him to succeed. Next player we're going to be looking at here, Amon Ross St. Brown, wide receiver 9. We have talked about him a lot this year, and he is expensive. He's probably more expensive than what ADP is going to say. He's been nicked up a little bit, but he's going to be fine. 28% target share and a 25% share of the air yards last year. The thing about Amon Ross St. Brown, when you compare him to some of the top wide receivers in the league, when you compare him to those top young horses at the top of the wide receiver ranks, he's cheap compared to them. He's expensive, but you also do not want to leave your first three to five rounds feeling good about the wide receiver position because this year, how everyone's drafting, as we've seen throughout the summer, the wide receiver well is drying up pretty quick and you got to take risks at the wide receiver spot in the middle to late rounds. That's something you do not want a bulk of your wide receiver core to be. So to feel good at the wide receiver position and still be very Bayesian with the running back position in the first couple rounds, Amon Ross St. Brown is a solid get. You see some people talking about getting him in the late first round. You hear about some people getting him in the second round. Honestly, when it comes to ADP, nothing's set in stone yet. Not everybody's been drafting, really. We've been working off best ball ADP. That's where we got the large enough sample size. Wide receiver 9 right there. Probably going to move up a little bit. He's been looking good. The volume of the offense is going to trend his way. It's going to continue to look like that. Average 16.7 points per game last year. And we could see that increase. We could really see that move up. He looks good. He's consistent. It's rare that he's outside of double-digit fantasy points on the low end. It's very rare that he's getting you nine or less fantasy points in a game and he's got upside to score almost 40 like we saw last year and really that could increase that could really help you out i look for him to be ready week one i look for him to be good to go and this guy is one of those guys who's got a lot of dog in him balls in the air he's gonna snag it works out harder than most wide receivers you ever seen i'm on ross st brown I feel like for the price is a good get because you're comparing him to the top wide receivers. He's the top wide receiver for what you're getting. It's a good value. Next, Kirk Cousins, QB 1380p, and I love the picture. I had to put that one up there. So the price tag here, solid. Top five in yards and attempts last year. 
Vikes were seventh in pace, which means they kick out more plays per game, which means more opportunities. He's got Justin Jefferson, perfect wide receiver to lean on. Every quarterback in the history of the NFL would say that to you. Jordan Addison added there's just more to help you out loving Kirk Cousins because he's a good wide receiver. I mean, you got Kenny Pickett drafting the first round. I say that every time I bring up Jordan Addison in the last couple years because he's that good. Kirk Cousins, QB 13, could give you QB 1 production. That's QB 12 to 1, somewhere in that range. Due to the volume in the offense, due to the weapons he's got in the passing game, Dalvin Cook's gone. They might lean more on the passing game anyways, and we got a lot of volume in the offense here. And you're getting him at QB2 price tag. Borderline QB1, I know, but it's still there. So if you want to wait a little bit on quarterback and you want somebody who's stable, you got your guy right here. And he's also got TJ Hawkinson too. A guy over the middle that he can sling the rock to as well. Pretty safe asset. As long as he's on the field, he's good to go for it. But let's look at the tight end position again. Dalton Schultz, tight end 14 and ADP. CJ Stroud's there at quarterback. Like we've seen in the preseason, he's a rookie and he's going to do rookie things. That might help the game scripts a little bit. Houston rocked six tight ends last year and they together had 131 targets, 77 catches, and 959 yards. That could be Dalton Schultz in some way, shape, or form with that production. At least some of that to him really depends on what Stroud wants to do with the football. So there's a lot of opportunity in this offense for Dalton Schultz to really make an impact here in fantasy especially at his price tag, tight end 14. You're looking at him as a tight end 2 in fantasy, in value. But the thing about that is he could give you those spike weeks here and there, especially when they're in the red zone, they go to him, or he has a game where he gets a few extra targets. Because Straub might be going to the tight end a little bit more than what you're expecting, a little bit more. He'll be on the field, he'll be running routes. And the thing about tight end, you either want to pay up for the top guys, or you want to wait a bit. And getting him, you're waiting a bit, which is a good thing. You're getting him in double-digit rounds. You're loaded up at wide receiver. You're loaded up at running back. And say this doesn't work out, you can still stream the position. And the sunk cost isn't really going to kick you in the nuts too much. And you just keep working those tight ends. And that's a good thing to know. And a lot of weeks, a lot of weeks, say the tight end 8 through 10 isn't really scoring much more fantasy points then the tight end 25. I'm talking like four to five more. So honestly, the risk here, you're getting a tight end running routes on the field, getting opportunity, could be seeing targets, and you're paying a cheap price tag for. Sign me up for that. Sign me up for that as I'm loading up on wide receivers and running backs. Next, we're looking at Sky Moore being valued as wide receiver 50 and ADP for underdog. That's going up. That's going up because... Juju's gone. He's going to be in a slot with that Juju role. Juju almost had a 1,000 yards receiving last year. He had some opportunity almost to the wide receiver 30 range. And if you're in the wide receiver 30 range scoring in fantasy, that means he's giving you a return on investment where you're drafting Sky Moore at. The volume's going to be there in the passing game. I look for him to increase his value in ADP over the next few days and weeks as we get more stability in this Chiefs death chart, Kadarius Tony's hurt. Should be back sometime. Who knows? But he should be back sometime. But I think Sky Moore has really earned a role in this offense. Earned some trust with Patrick Mahomes. Look for targets to be flowing his way. Look for him to get some opportunity. And at the price tag, you got a cheap bet. You got a cheap bet in a very, very explosive offense. You want pieces of this Chiefs offense. This is one way to do it. Sky Moore, decent size, adjust athleticism, especially with the speed. Good metrics coming out of college, a good breakout age, good market share production. Had an off rookie season, but really he was coming back from a G5 school and the transition process took him a little longer. They did sign Juju, who they wanted to put in the slots. So they just gave him a year to ramp up. They gave him a red shirt season. Now he's here. Now he's getting an opportunity. These young Chiefs wide receivers have been doing it. You may want to invest in at least one of them on your fantasy team. Next, we're looking at Javante Williams, RB23 and ADP. Honestly, I think the RB23 value in ADP is a little bit high considering what's left on the board. That being said, you're also making a bet. And you got to make a bet somewhere in your draft. You got to take a gamble, maybe even two. You're betting on recovery. 
You're recovering. He comes back to what he looks like during his rookie season. You're also a part of value here at the running back position. And in the draft, where the well's starting to run dry at other positions, there might be another running back that falls to you to the next pick. There might be another wide receiver that falls to you to the next pick. And you want to take that gamble. As a rookie, he had 53 targets, RB14. That's him sharing the workload with Melvin Gordon, him being worked in slowly. We saw how he was running between the tackles. In preseason, he's been getting some run. He's been getting some opportunities. Looking good to go. Reports are sounding very good, sounding very encouraging. If he was healthy right now, he'd be pushing for a first-round draft pick status, maybe round two-ish range. You're catching him borderline middle rounds right now. He's pushing RB3 status in value right now. So you're seeing that. Still a little pricey because this is a gamble. This could go to zero on you due to the injury, but you got to gamble somewhere in the draft. That's the main thought process here. Where are you going to gamble at? Is it this part? The later you gamble, the less of a gamble is. The odds of it hitting is going to be decreased immensely. But where are you going to gamble at? Who's it going to be? Honestly, I think the first few rounds, you want to play it safe. You do not want to bust on those picks. Once you get out of like the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th round range, there's got to be a gamble somewhere on there where you're shooting for upside because you can't be having roster cloggers everywhere too or that's going to hurt you playing the waiver wire. So who are you going to gamble on? Could it be Javante Williams? That could be a suggestion for you. But think about that as you're going into your drafts. Who would you love to gamble on? Next, we're looking at James Conner, RB26, who's a little bit cheaper. Look at the production here over the last couple years. Look at those green candlesticks. Those are RB1 weeks. We have a top end of 40.3, averaging 16.4 PPR points per game. Injuries have been an issue, but there's not many games he really missed when you come to think about it. You think about things on the back end while you're live setting lineups, how annoying it is especially this first start of last year when he had a run of games that didn't turn out so good coming back from injuries and stuff. But again, he can be productive. He can be. He's an older running back, but you're catching him at a cheap price tag. That's RB3 level. We're out of RB2 range. 24 or back in there. RB24 or higher is RB3 or worse. He's in RB3 range. Barely in it, but he is. That's where he's valued, and he's giving you some green candlesticks. Maybe you want to take that value on, maybe not. Even if he gives you mostly black candlesticks, he's still giving you a return on investment. If he averages 11 points per game, he's giving you a return on investment. That's something to think about because he's being valued as RB26 right now per underdog. Next is DeAndre Swift. RB28 and ADP, he's falling a little bit because people are trying to figure out this backfield, but he's being valued as an RB3, a middle RB3 at that. Not a top end guy. Not a top end guy. Someone who's dead nuts in the RB3 range. 6.3 yards per touch, 1.78 yards per route ran in the passing game. I get it. They don't throw it too much to the running backs, but they didn't have an asset like Swift. And on top of that, say it doesn't happen with Swift in the passing game, he's already being valued there. He's already being valued there. Say you're worried about his injuries. Well, it's he's already being valued there. Now you're just hoping for the upside. We're not paying RB14 to RB10 price anymore for Swift. We're not paying that. We're paying him around RB30-ish. Around RB30-ish because in your draft, these players are not going to fall in order of ADP. Call it RB30-ish. That's a good price tag for a guy with this upsize. 1.13 points for opportunity. So whenever the ball's coming his way, whether it's a target or a touch, a carry, 1.13 points per that. He's one of the best in the league at being efficient, scoring fantasy points. 13.7 points per game. He scores you 13.7 points per game here with the Eagles. He's giving you a return on investment. He is giving you back that. Remember, thinking about him at Detroit Lions, think about how you felt about that. Now, if he does that here in Philly, you're getting a return on the investment. Even more than probably this RB28 because I imagine people are going to fade him a little bit more in home league drafts. So think about it that way. Think about the price versus player and think about the upside. Who are you going to gamble on? Who are you going to take your chance on? Next, James Cook, RB2980P. ADP. We want the Bills offense, honestly. We want the Bills offense. We want as many pieces of it. He's targeted on 30% of the routes that he runs. 
That means he is going to be used heavily in the passing game. They brought in Damian Harris. They're going to use James Cook more in the passing game because he's more explosive. He's very efficient. 19.6 targets to running backs. Josh Allen throws on his 35 pass attempts per game. There's volume here. There's opportunity here. He's all right between the tackles. You wouldn't call him the next Saquon Barkley or anything, but price tag here, you're getting some upside. You're getting a running back in a very good offense. He's been looking good in preseason. He's got some burst and wiggle to his game. Could be a fun player to watch. RB30 price range. RB30 price range. Who do you want here? Next, Danny Dimes. We talked about him earlier with Waller, but QB 1480p. QB2 price tag, and you're talking about a guy that is very efficient from a fantasy football perspective. 0.57 fantasy points per drop back. Seventh in the league. We should see the volume increase as these wide receivers remain healthy. There's so many slot receivers on this team that you can just plug and play with them. And then you got Waller. As long as Waller's looking good and healthy, Daniel Jones is going to be paying dividends for fantasy gamers. 14th in pass attempts, 708 rushing yards. I look for that to decrease a little bit since that's his career high. 708 seems like it'd be on the high end, but still, 500, 600, 450. That's still a good floor for a quarterback in fantasy that you're getting at QB14 because honestly, quarterbacks that can run the ball that can get you fantasy points by running it are not falling out of the QB1 range. They're just not doing it. Daniel Jones could be a guy that can give you value there at QB2 price tag. But who are you shooting your shot on in your drafts? I want to hear about it. Who's that one player you're stepping up and just drafting no matter what and a lot of people hate? Let me know in the comments below. I want to hear about that. Smash that subscribe button on the way out, and I'll catch you on the next video.